Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. Great, on time, 945. So what I'd like to do is make an introduction to the first talk of the, of the 2011 DCC. We got Scotty Cowling, WA2DFI. He's going to give us our high-performance, software-defined radio update. I want a special request for Gary. I want a Max, Max Headroom version of yeah. my talk, so I well, go... Do, 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 do. This is kind of I don't do that very well. Okay. And there's an advantage to being the first one up, because for the first 45 minutes, you're the best speaker at DCC. So. Okay, um, I, I always try to do this at the beginning. How many people uh, own HPSDR boards? Okay, about half. And how many people know what HPSDR is? Oh, wow. Okay, how many people don't know what HPSDR is? Oh, wow. two brave souls. Okay. Well, this first couple slides are for you because all you other guys have seen these for like six years now. So I want to get started with what is HPSDR. And uh, basically, it's a uh, modular open source hardware project. And, and actually, it's kind of evolving past that, as you'll see toward the end of my presentation here. But it's uh, really an experimenter's platform more than it is a turnkey radio. But it's mostly a group of volunteers dedicated to advancing the state of the art in software defined radio. And the group is well over 1,000 now on the HPS, open HPSTR mailing list. So it's getting pretty big. So the accent is high performance as in high performance. And based upon open source model, that's hardware and software. And also modular, as you'll see, we have a backplane with boards that plug in, and advances the state of the radio art. That's one of our goals also. OK, so what does Tapper do? We support the development with R&D funding. We figure if you guys are going to, I mean, you guys are really the HPSCR group. I mean, part of it. There's not 1,000 people here, but I'm sure some of you are contributors. Uh, we welcome anybody to be a contributor. And what we figure is if you spend your time developing hardware and software, especially hardware, you shouldn't have to pay to build the hardware. So what Tapper does is they offer to help pay for your prototypes and alpha builds. So you can actually verify your hardware, debug it, make sure it works properly. And what we also do is participate in early volume production so that we can get lots of whatever widget you design out into the hands of lots of people. And for you software guys, you can probably appreciate that. A lot of software development occurs much more quickly when there's 500 pieces of hardware out there. When there's two or three or one guy built one in his basement, you know, how many software guys are you going to get to use that one piece of hardware? Probably just the one who built it. So it has a real advantage in getting, gaining critical mass. So as a result, we get a uh, larger and larger pool of contributors. And we're actually seeing that on HPSDR now, that we've got lots of hardware out there. We're seeing more and more software guys coming forward. There's more and more options for you to use when you want to operate your radio on the PC. But OpenHPSDR and Tapper are separate. We facilitate, they complement each other. Tapper's a facilitator. OK, now one of the problems you have is when Tapper's really not a manufacturing organization, although some people will argue. But we do the first run. And then our choice then, after that, is do we want to do the second run of the same old thing, or do we want to do a first run of something new? And so we tend toward the, let's do a first run of something new. So in that case, what happens to the boards after Tapper's first run is sold out? Well, it's all open hardware, right? So anybody can pick it up. Well, one of the people that's picked it up is actually, we, Dan uh, Babcock and I formed a company called iQuad Labs to do that very thing. And we run it basically the same as Tapper. We run it on very low margins. The idea is to keep HPSDR boards available for everyone for uh, as long as we can do it. Not affiliated with Tapper. Um, basically a retail outlet. This, the people who built the HPSDR boards, which is my company, 
we did it as on a volunteer basis. We still build, use the same people, same contract manufacturer, same people are doing the board. So you can be assured when you get that board, it's the same board that the people who bought it from Tapper got. And currently we're offering Magister Mercury and Penny Lane, which are the three boards that Tapper is sold out of. And ideally we'll offer other STR related hardware in the future as things evolve. And there's our website, so enough of the, uh, the plug, we'll get on with it. So now, what can I build with my, uh, with my boards? If you want a basic half watt direct sampling radio, you need a backplane to plug everything into. You need some kind of PC interface to talk to the PC. We have several choices. The Aussie is the original USB gateway. It's been uh, sold out for a while now. Magister is its replacement. So you can hook the radio to your computer by USB 2. Or you can use the Metis board, which is a gigabit Ethernet interface. So you can pick either one of those, whichever you like. There are certain advantages to Metis that, uh, since it serves as data up over UDP, uh, then you can listen to your receiver remotely. You can operate the radio remotely over the internet if you like. And we'll see an example of that later. Transmitter, Penelope was the original half watt transmitter. Uh, that's been sold out for a while. It's been replaced by an improved transmitter called Penny Lane. Has a bit better uh, PA stage and it also has a bit better scheme for uh, adjusting the power output. Uh, receivers, Mercury direct sampling receiver. That is still available. That's from iQuad Labs. Power supply is a LPU, it's called linear power unit. It is a, was to be a stopgap unit because we really want a switcher in this thing because we don't want the heat generated by a linear power supply. But the switcher project seemed to be taking so long that uh, we came up with the LPU, which is kind of a, uh, a stopgap measure. It generates a lot of heat, which means you need a fan in the box, which I don't particularly like. But it does work. It's very low noise because there's no switching involved. And it was easy to design and, and be low noise. We also have an enclosure, nice uh, powder coated chassis box manufactured by Tentec for us that everything fits in. So these components here will comprise a basic half watt radio. And incidentally, the Penny Lane transmitter is clean enough since it's direct, uh, uh, basically is a D to A connected to the antenna. It's the, the harmonics and spurious outputs are low enough, you don't need any filtering. So you can connect it directly to the antenna. Okay, suppose you want a little bit more, or like a, a higher power, or you want, say you want to use a uh, soft rock, which is different kind of architecture because it's a QSD, QSE, it's a, a mixer type radio as opposed to a direct sampling radio. Well, we have a solution to that. You basically use the same backplane and your same gateway, and actually you can use Metis here if you decide you'd rather use that. And then you use a baseband converter board called Janus, which is basically a high resolution, low, uh, it's the 24 bit, 192 kilohertz sample A to D and D to A. So it's basically a baseband converter. So you can take your soft rock or whatever IQ type radio, any IQ data stream, and you can feed it into the Janus board. And this basically acts like a high performance sound card, although we don't have drivers on the PC to make it look like a sound card to Windows, it acts like a sound card and is much higher performance than any sound card you can get. I mean, those of you familiar with the, uh, the Flex Radio 1000? How many of you know about the Flex Radio 1000? You know what that is? Okay, and you remember the problems Gerald had with making sure that you had a good sound card to use that radio? You can't just plug it into your onboard sound card. It just doesn't work. Your performance is really set by the sound card. So that's what we did is we made a high performance sound card that gets rid of that problem. And then of course the same Pandora chassis. Okay, so now if you want a uh, higher power radio, what you can do is you can take the same boards and you can add a 20 watt PA. And unfortunately when you do this, you introduce some uh, spurious outputs because the PA is not particularly linear, not as linear as you'd like, it doesn't meet FCC requirements. So we have a filter set. And you, You've all heard me uh, talk endlessly about Alex. Well, now you can say Alex is out and it's done. I I'm done anyway. Now you guys get to play with it. So the fun begins for everyone else. I had my fun already. Okay, so now I'm gonna run down the boards really quick here. Um, I've already talked a little bit about what each one does, but I kind of give you a summary here. So we've got the back plane, either of these, they're basically interchangeable depending on whether you wanna talk USB or gig E. Penny Lane is the, the transmitter that you would use. Mercury is the receiver. So you've got backplane, communications, transmitter, receiver. Those are your basic building blocks. 
and power supply, and you can use the, the power supply on the Atlas board, the power connector is an ATX connector. So you can use an old PC power supply if you can tolerate all the noise it'll spew out. And actually, some people have had pretty good success with that. Also, you can use um, the, um, their Pico PSUs. They're available from Minibox, and they're about the, half the size of a business card, and they plug right into the ATX connector. And we've had pretty good luck with those, although they are a little noisy. They, they work reasonably well. That's what we use for all our testing, as you'll see in a minute here. OK, so uh, talked about Pandora. Alex, which is the low-pass filter set. This has a few other features that are nice. It has a TR relay built into it. It has a six-meter preamp. Uh, it has um, a directional coupler, so you can measure power out and power in, reflected power. And it interfaces directly to uh, the Mercury board for control for selection of the filters. And then the 20 watt PA, I think my pointer's going away here. Okay, a few additional boards. We talked about the Janus board here. And this is your baseband board that you use if you want to use some other source of I and Q data. Uh, we have an extender board. And I get into trouble when I say there's not really any use for the extender board because lots of people have found uses for it. So it basically gets the, any of the boards up out of the chassis. So if you have a Pandora and you have your Atlas mounted in it and you want to work on one of your boards, scope anything, you can use that Pinocchio to get your boards out of the chassis. We also have for you uh, time nuts out there. We have a, a 10 megahertz reference. It's a, uh, a TCXO and it's also an external input so you can uh, use a, uh, a GPS calibrated oscillator as a reference. And then uh, GERD over in Germany has made a uh, shrunk down three slot version of the six slot Atlas backplane. And he also has an antenna switch with the six meter low noise amplifier on it, which this came out way before Alex did. So some, of the, some people have been using this. This has a TR switch on it. So it enabled you to take your one half watt radio and actually hook it up in the conventional way like a transceiver. This is kind of a block diagram of uh, all the different pieces. So we got Com, pick your COM board, receiver, transmitter, Excalibur for, for crystal control, Janus board, and again, if you're using a direct sampling radio, these top blocks here, don't, this is optional by the way, but these top blocks, you don't need this. this. This would be if you wanted to use a QSD, QSE type front end. And then a power supply, and Demeter was the, the switching power supply that was being worked on for years, but it hasn't really gone anywhere, so that's, that's why LPU came into the picture to get us on the air. Okay, I'm going to go through this real quick here. Backplane. This is the old Aussie board, and this is the new Magister that replaces it. Very similar. The only difference is this has a interface for the SDR1000, which we dropped in the Magister board because SDR1000 is out of production. So, so if you want to control an SDR1000, you're going to need to get an Aussie board somewhere off the internet. Okay, this is the Metis board, gig E socket up here and your I, digital I.O. for PTT and their paddle inputs. This is the original Penelope transmitter with my favorite part right here, the toroids. <laughs> I think Dan still has scars on his thumb from winding those toroids and stripping off the insulation. This is the replacement one. Notice there's no toroids. I owe Phil PK6 APH big time for that because uh, he uh, replaced the toroids with a mini circuits part. So, and notice that up here there's two ICs. This is the improved PA, it's a two stage PA, so your output power doesn't drop off on six meters as much as it did with the old Penny, Penelope. This is the Mercury, same old Mercury, still the same one. LPU, notice the uh, microscopic heat sinks here. <laughs> and when you mount this in the case, the fan in the case blows right on these, so it heats the box up really nice. Keep your shack warm in the winter. This is the chassis box. The blue fan is optional. <laughs> but this, this does make the radio run much faster when you put a blue fan in there. <laughs> it really helps. It's actually red? <laughs> huh? OK. Color rendering is not my strong thing. OK. Uh, Alex, this is. This is probably close in your minds, as I know it's close in mine since I just spent the past uh, two months finalizing these. Dan and I slaved away and got these going. Basically, a two-board set, uh, high-pass filters to receive, low-pass filters to transmit, 
uh, standard form factor, so it's the pair of the board slides right into a, a, a very nice Hammond box that mounts inside of Pandora, so you get uh, double shielding. It's SPI bus controlled, so uh, it plugs, the cable plugs right into Mercury, and the software can control the filters directly. And the, it's got attenuators on it, antenna selection, uh, a lot of features. Runs on 12 volts, uh, and you can operate it alone if you uh, can figure out how to uh, build yourself a little PIC controller to uh, run the SPI bus. It's very simple. And main thing is no degradation to Mercury IP3. They, they originally tried to do this without relays at the beginning and uh, switched the filters in with uh, FETs, and they could not get it to work without degrading the, the fantastic IP3 of Mercury, so they gave up and used the ancient clunky relays. And no oscillators, so you don't have to worry about uh, any noise. This is a Penny Whistle 20 watt PA. This comes as a kit. Pretty easy to build, all large components. Kits are available now. This is kind of a throwback. This is the Janus board. You can see over on the right here all the uh, audio ins and outs. This is actually uh, a, a duplicate of signals that are on one of the audio jacks. I don't know why they put an RJ jack there, but it's. So if you want to use a soft rock or some other IQ radio, you'd use this board. And the infamous extender the toughest board to build. This is a kit also. And this is Excalibur with the TCXO there in the middle and external input for your GPS discipline oscillator and one toroid there on the bottom. You get to wind that though, this is a kit also. Okay, some boards available from GERD. Uh, if you want to get with me after I can give you this address if you want to contact him. Uh, if you want to build a little mini uh, HPSDR, he's got a three-slot backplane available. And uh, the antenna switch is a in, more inexpensive solution for people who don't want any filtering that Alex provides. Okay, on to the new stuff, which is what's more exciting. Uh, Hermes, which is what, how many people have heard of Hermes? Okay, it's, for those who haven't, it's basically a Mercury, a Penny Lane, and a Metis board all crammed onto one board. And the way we did that is every one of those three boards I just mentioned has an FPGA on it. So we just put one big FPGA on and hooked everything to that, and then all of the code now for the three boards resides in the one FPGA. So it enabled us to shrink the thing down. And of course, it's not quite as easy as all that, but if you ask the guy who had to lay it out, but uh, it's a pretty nice board. In fact, I'm going to pass this around. This is the uh, first artwork. First, this is going to be the pre-production board of Hermes, so if you want to pass that down the way. It's an eight-layer board, uh, 120 by 160 millimeters, uh, fits into a chassis similar to Alex with its matching companion, the Apollo board, which is a 15-watt PA, and the low-pass filters, and an ATU, all built on one board. It's not as comprehensive a board set as Alex is, obviously, because it's only one board, but it has pretty much everything that you need to uh, build a complete radio out of a two-board set that fits in one Eurocard case. Um, Chell over in Norway is working on a 100 watt PA, and I, he's just had a breakthrough this past week, which I'll tell you about in a minute here. Also, uh, Phil uh, Harmon's working on a 1 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. So use your uh, HPSDR not only to uh, work guys in Europe, but you can uh, work your own equipment that you're building and see what kind of output you get with spectrum analyzer. Uh, and Griffin is the newest one. I, I, did you? How many people saw Phil's talk at Dayton this year? Just a couple. Well, if you want to see that, come and see me afterwards and I'll give you a copy of it because he has a great article on uh, whisper beacons and using radar. Basically, it's radar to predict propagation. And this is, Griffin is a, a single board standalone unit to generate those whisper beacon signals, those chirp radar signals. Okay, so a little bit about Hermes. Basically, it's a direct sampling receiver just like Mercury. And I kind of tried to put in here the things so this came from Mercury. The codec section is the same as Penny Lane, same PA. Uh, we use a big FPGA. I think there's a 3C25 on Mercury. Or that's even smaller than that. Uh, but this is the biggest FPGA that we could get that wasn't a BGA. So, because layout becomes a lot more difficult when you use a BGA. So we use the biggest one we can get without using a BGA. Same gigabit internet, Ethernet interface that Metis has. The same spy interface to Apollo Hermes or 
Hermes companion or Alex, and I'll get to what this is in a second. Probably no one has heard about this. I hadn't heard about this until a couple of days ago. But uh, some extra digital I.O. This is for controlling for the analog inputs could be for anything you want, digital inputs and outputs. We already have key and PTT inputs, but these could be used to control uh, amplifiers, could be used to uh, take inputs from, uh, well, not from SWR meter because we have that, but used, can be used to control amplifiers basically, or send band data out if you want to do that, those kind of things. Uh, input attenuator, this also has changed from the first version of Hermes. Used to be either 0, 10, or 20 dB. Now it's 31 dB and 1 dB steps selectable under software control. Includes a preamp and an onboard switch mode power supply designed by Shell, LA2NI. So this is really nice because now if you've got a little bit higher voltage, now you get less current required because the power is basically constant. And they had to, to put all this stuff on the same card as the version one Hermes, which this has been under development for about two years. They had to increase the size of the card by 20 millimeters. So it used to be 100 by 160. Now it's, the, as you can see, that one is uh, 120 by 160. Okay, so full duplex operation, because obviously the A to D and the D to A are separate, so you can run them at the same time. Same 122.88 master clock. Stereo audio, there's a speaker amplifier as well as headphone and line outs. Dedicated transverter output is there also. Very good performance. I mean, it's the same as Mercury. And the, the testing Abby has done, who is the one who laid it out, uh, he, he claims that the, it's quieter than Mercury. His layout's quieter than Mercury, if that's possible. Because Mercury was very good. And as you guys saw, I think at uh, Dayton two years ago, we were running an HPSDR setup and we had one of these prototypes and we said, well, okay, they say it's compatible hardware and it's Mercury and Penelope and all cut and pasted together. Well, how compatible is it really? So let's just unplug the HPSDR and plug in this Hermes and see what happens. And it worked. So it's very compatible. So right now, the, where we're at is the uh, original version had the USB similar to the, uh, the Aussie board. And after we saw how well the Metis worked, we decided, well, we got to lead the state of the art here. We, can't, we don't want to use USB. So they went to a new version, now a relay out, and that's what that one's going around. Now that has gig ethernet on it. So it's actually the Alpha 4 board, because we built two versions with USB, and this is the second version with gig E, so it's, we call it Alpha 4. And uh, Abhi, who has done the layout, he's uh, from India, and he's uh, just a genius. And uh, he did that layout there that you see, and he had those boards built. He couldn't stand having us prototype something that he hadn't tested himself after he laid it out. So he went ahead and built one himself. <laughs> and he says it works great, so uh, we're pretty confident that that's going to be the manufactured version. This is the block diagram. This is kind of an eye chart here. This is the old version here. And you can see, if I can get this to work, that uh, Penelope, we upgraded to the Penny Lane type uh, PA output. And we got rid of the Magister USB and put in uh, Ethernet. And I like this chart better than the newer chart because it breaks into the three boards that it replaces much easier than the new block diagram he has. It's kind of all interleaved together and it's hard to split it up like this. But this is intended to show that all we did is take the same three boards and redo the hardware onto one board. So it looks like the three boards to the software. Same here, this is the block diagram. All this right here in this, in this shaded block in the center, that's all inside the FPGA. So all your filtering and decimation is done inside the FPGA. And that's a picture of Abby's uh, version. That's the built version of that board that's going around right now. Should have gotten a bigger power switch, though. When this power switch is bigger than the FPGA, you know, I don't know about that. OK. Now, so what Abby said was, well, you know, I really want to run this board and, and test it all out as a complete radio, but uh, we don't have Apollo yet. So in his spare time, this is one of those weekend projects. If you guys get the inside joke on the weekend project, Alex was a weekend project too, or Graham, and it would, took two years. He built this, built this board that is basically a, an Apollo board, a, a, a dumbed down Apollo board. So there's no preamp on it. It's basically just a PA and low pass filter so set selected by relays. And what he did is he made the filter selection look just like Alex. 
And then Phil went and modified the FPGA so that now the Hermes board thinks it's connected to an Alex board. But it's really connected to this Hermes companion. And the reason I call it this is nobody gave a name to it. So if you got a suggestion for a name, we're, I don't know if this will ever actually make it into production because this is just a test board that Avi built with these components on it here just to test out his Hermes build. And when you, uh, when you look at this, you're just going to be astounded because this is his weekend project. I wish I could do that in a weekend. <laughs> it's like, so, I mean, it took me two years to make the ones you guys got. And it's got those evil toroids on it, too. Anyway, so that's what he used for his testing of Hermes. So on to Apollo. This is basically complements Hermes to give you a complete radio in one box. Uh, a lot of features like the Hermes, com or like the, the companion for Hermes. Um, low pass filters based on Alex, but reduce power, because Alex is designed for 100 watts. This only needs to handle 15 watts, so reduce that. And also just low pass filters, no high pass filters. So basically like the Alex TX board. Same spy control, although the format is a little different, the electrical connection is the same. So the connector is the same. So it plugs on onto uh, Alex if you wanted to do that because it's compatible. And there's an ATU on here using an Atmel MCU. And w so what's happening now is Chell, who designed the first prototype at 100 millimeters wide, now, of course, Hermes is 120 millimeters wide, so we want some to mat mate up with that and slide into the enclosure. So he's nearly done with the artwork update to make the board a little bit bigger. It's always a lot easier making it bigger than smaller, right? So it, it, he's, he's almost done with that. And the idea is to release this right after Hermes. We'll see how that goes, because this one has toroids on it and the other one doesn't. But I have a cunning plan for toroids, so don't worry. And that's the first prototype of uh, Apollo. You can see it's got a little bit of uh, a fun stuff over here. Lots of toroids and relays. And see, this is the enclosure that it goes in. The, you remove the, the top slide-in plate. It goes in these grooves here to fully enclose it. OK, and that is actually what we had at Dayton last year and the year before. That is the the USB version of Hermes and the matching Apollo that you just saw on the previous slide in a box. Standard enclosure. So Hammond makes a lot, slightly larger 20 millimeter wider enclosure that will house the new board. So it'll look just like this, only a little bit bigger. And it'll have an Ethernet jack back here on the back instead of USB. This is the simplified block diagram. I, it's, I know it's difficult to understand here, but I made it as simple as I could. <laughs> And actually, you see this is old because it still has USB up here. So this is uh, SDR for everyone because simple to understand. This won't be quite turnkey. I mean, it'll be hardware-wise, it'll be turnkey. But you're still going to have to, it's going to be for the people more willing to experiment. OK, uh, Shell over in Norway is working on the uh, Munin, I guess is how you pronounce it. And a uh, 100 watt PA, uh, now, now Gerd had a 100 watt PA called Hercules that he built in Germany, but unfortunately the power transistors are not available for it anymore. So uh, I, I, you could probably buy a board, but I don't know how much good that would do you because <laughs> you can't build it. So uh, Chell has come up with this design. He just had a break for, breakthrough uh, this past week. He was, uh, had the amplifier set up, and he couldn't get more than about 80 watts out of it at this uh, minus 30 dBc uh, distortion products. And he's wondering, well, the uh, ICOM 7000 uses the same transistors as he does, and they get plenty of power out. So why, why doesn't this work? So what he did is he looked at the output transformer, and he noted that they were using a different transformer, and it was constructed differently. So he went back and did a little more research, and he found on an old Motorola app note dated years ago the proper way to construct the output transformer. And when he changed the construction of the transformer, this is what he got now. And same distortion products. And he said, I put the new transformer in. I didn't touch anything else. And boom, I got 120 watts out, 130 watts on 80 to 10, and over 100 watts on 6 meters. So, and that's with 500 milliwatts drive. So this can be driven directly by Penny Lane. So he's excited now. We're all excited now. So this may come out uh, very soon after uh, 
after Penny, or maybe it'll come out about the same time as Hermes. But it's usable on a regular system too, with uh, just with Penelope, the regular HPSTR system. So that'll be pretty exciting, get you above the 20 watt level. And here's a picture of his prototype here. This is the transformer I was talking about. And I believe this is wired the, the old way. And he tried to explain it to me how he wired it. I don't understand how he did it, but I understand that it worked and he knows how to make it work, so that's, that's going to be good. I don't have to know the answer, I just have to know who to go to to ask that does know the answer. Okay, Cyclops is, uh, this project has been around for a couple years and it's kind of languishing. Phil's been busy doing other things. These are the original specs. Uh, one gigahertz uh, bandwidth spectrum analyzer on a standard. This is a regular Atlas card and I'll show you a picture of it here. That's the block diagram. I don't want to get too much into this because as you'll see in a second here, that's the original prototype. What they've decided now since it's been two years is there are lots of new ICs out that will allow better performance. So they're going back, he's got a new partner over in Australia who's going to help him with this and they're going to redesign this to, well that's a screenshot of the original one, the prototype. But they're going to redesign this to a 4 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. And they've got an evaluation kit here for this uh, synthesizer I see that they think uh, holds lots of promise. So they're evaluating that right now. And it's Phil and Burned, BK5ABH, they're doing that. So you should look for that now, coming up pretty soon. Well, pretty soon, probably by date and you'll see something, uh, so we'll have something to show for that. Griffin, this is what we were ta I talked about earlier, touched on earlier. They, this is, uh, has been built up using a Penelope transmitter as a base, but the idea is to build a standalone board that you don't need a computer for that will generate chirp and whisper beacons. Because you don't need much power and you've got a big FPGA, on, we'll have a big FPGA on the board, so you ought to be able to generate these beacons on HF six meters or two meters without much to do with hardware. But they've got it lashed up with a, a Jupiter GPS. And Phil just told me last night they managed to take the 10 kilohertz reference oscillator out of the Jupiter and they managed to phase lock the 122 megahertz crystal in Mercury to the GPS. He wasn't sure if he was going to be able to do that, but apparently he's been successful. So they take the two outputs, the, this they phase lock the transmitter, not the receiver, and then they use one PPS for syncing the transmissions. And one of the interesting things he's done is he time stamps the data, the received data coming to Mercury by using the LSB of the microphone data. So I, he, it wasn't clear exactly how he does this. My guess is that he's going to ensure that if it's audio MIC data that it's zero and when the bit's a one, then the data is going to be a timestamp. So he can timestamp the, the received packet, which is going to be really useful for uh, what he needs to do with his radar. And he's got a couple guys now helping him. Uh, Two guys in Germany who are about 20 kilometers apart, and uh, uh, Herman is uh, writing decode software in CUDA, and I don't know if, how many people know what CUDA is, but it's a, uh, an environment that allows you to write software to, to process, to, to run your code on the uh, GPU, graphics processor, as well as the PC CPU. So you get a lot more performance because for us, I mean, our GPUs are probably sitting there just spinning most of the time because we, we don't have a graphic intensive things. Um, you know, maybe a, a waterfall display is, it has some graphics component, but not like the gamers have. So you've got your GPU sitting there with all this performance going to waste. So that's what CUDA does, is it uh, takes advantage of all that. So they, apparently they have these working now between their, their uh, locations, 20 kilometers apart, and we'll, we should be getting the results shortly. Also, he's got uh, some, uh, fellows down in uh, VK land that uh, have a remote, and this VK3O, he, Andrew, I, he, I believe he's the one that uh, Phil presented in his paper at Dayton. He's the one that was doing the testing with some propagation studies in Northeast Australia. And they're using MATLAB to decode the data, which of course Herman was gonna fix once he gets his CUDA code done. And this is currently under development. They're, they're still working on the prototype, so. And this is the uh, eye chart beacon Exciter. And this, this will be the standalone unit. And if you look at this, you can see some of the components, like the same phi that's on Metis and uh, big FPGA in the center here. 
and you could kind of recognize some of the things that were derived from some of the earlier boards. So what can we do with all this stuff? Well, how about multiple receivers? Uh, what you can do, since the data coming from the antenna is all digitized, the entire band is digitized, 0 to 65 megahertz, all that data is available to the FPGA. Well, now you have a slight problem because not all that data is available to the PC because you've got this little narrow pipe that goes between the radio and the PC. Whether it be USB 2 or Gig E, it's still small in comparison to the entire band. So what happens in the FPGA is you decimate it down and pick a slice out of that big bandwidth and you send that to the PC for processing. Well, how about you just pick four different slices and send all those at the same time? We can handle four. We can probably handle eight, 10, 12, some, some small number. So what we do is we take four independent receivers, basically they're virtual receivers. They slice out segments of the 65 megahertz bandwidth and they send four data streams down to the PC. And the PC then decodes in parallel these four data streams and it looks to the PC like there's four receivers out there, but in fact there's only one board. Well now when you get to Hermes, it's got a big FPGA on it, so now you can put eight receivers inside the FPGA. And really your only limitation, you've got two limitations, how big is my FPGA, how much can I cram into that, and how big is my pipe? Thanks. So anyway, that's... Uh, that's kind of what I'd explain down here. And since each data stream is created from all the data, it's, they're in, completely independent. So you can have independent mode, um, frequency. It's really a completely separate receiver. It uses one antenna, though, because it comes off the same data stream. And this is an example of four receivers being run. You can see the four windows here. They're on different frequencies. See, yeah, this one is on the broadcast band. This is on 40. This is on WWV, and this is on 20. And they're independently tunable and adjustable, just as if they were completely independent. OK, now, how about if you want, uh, if you're a hardware guy like me, and you, and you like lots of boards and hardware and big racks, um, Joe has come up with a scheme to put four Mercury boards into, or, into an Atlas backlinks. We have six slots, OK? So you can have receivers one slot, Interface is one slot, you got four left, so you can put four receivers in it. Now these receivers are really independent. They go to four separate antennas, but you can phase lock them to the same clock. So now you can do true diversity reception, phased antenna arrays, you can implement that in software. It's a very interesting setup. And if you have, what about if you have no antennas? Well, okay. If you, if you know your best buddy who lives up on the mountain peak that has a 10-element uh, 20-meter uh, beam on a 200-foot tower, I don't know anybody. Anybody that has that, come see me afterwards. I want to talk to you. I'll give you a free HPSDR setup, and we'll talk. So anyway, uh, the idea is that you set it up, and you hook it to the internet, and then anybody can, t can listen. Anybody can transmit. OK? And uh, this is, I, I don't really have time to get into this, but uh, Alex uh, brought up some interesting issues on filter selection. And so for you users of HPSDR, there's going to be a new uh, set of FPGA code coming out probably this weekend. Phil's working on it right now. He's beta testing it. Unfortunately, since he changed the command structure between the boards, now you have to upgrade all the firmware at the same time. In other words, upgrading Mercury firmware, Mercury then won't be compatible with Penelope. So you're going to have to update all four of them at the same time. So these are the new versions that will be out this weekend. OK, this is the token software page, because Jeremy told me I had to say something about software. So I'm not a software guy, but this is what he told me to say, because Jeremy says I have to. <laughs> so KISS console has been unified by George K9TRV which unifies the Ethernet and USB code. So now there's one piece of software that runs both. And this will be the basis of all the future releases from now on. And uh, Herman of uh, Whisper fame is also doing uh, a new version of which I happen to have a screen screenshot of here. This is my token software picture. This is not to belittle his effort. This is a really cool uh, rewritten program. It's all written in C and C++ instead of C Sharp. I have a, a quickie bonus program here. 
that uh, I want to show you guys. It uh, has to do with Alex testing, just to give you a glimpse into what we had to do to make these boards available for you guys. Okay, as you all know, um, Alex has kind of took a long time here. I noticed the uh, single digit dates here. But we finally got it done after all. I just put the slide in here to show you how long this took, okay? Which is, I should be embarrassed about, but actually I'm more relieved than embarrassed, so. <laughs> okay, so this is the transmit board, which you that bought them obviously have seen. The receive board. These, are, by the way, those are production boards, so new pictures. Now, how do we test all these? Well, I didn't have the money or the time to build a test fixture, or a new test fixture from scratch. So I thought, well, you know, I got boards here that already have the right BNCs on them to connect up, and they have relays on them to select them. Well, maybe I could just use those boards. So actually, that's what I did. I took an RX board, and I made the RX test fixture. I took a TX board, and I made the TX test fixture. Okay, and this is basically my cheat sheet for me. What do I have to do? This is a block diagram that I came up with of the board, okay, all these. And then I put X's over the part that I don't need, and I put these orange wires here are bypasses. So you can see what I did is I basically left these relays in, I bypassed the entire filter section, left that relay in, I bypassed the output low pass filter, and now I basically have a board that I can use under SPI control just like Alex is. I can select which one of those BNCs I want to get the signal from or to. So it's basically just a switchboard. But the beauty of it is I already have one. And so I told the contract manufacturer, make me up an Alex board, but don't put any of the through hole parts on it except these ones that I tell you. So he ran it through the line just like a regular Alex board, put all the SMT parts on it, and then I added a couple of three wires and after he put the relays on, which is there's only about five relays that he put on, and bingo, I got a test fixture. And there it is. And so then what I do is I use these double female BNCs up here, and I thought I was going to have to cut these ferrules off, but it turns out if you align them right, you don't have to. So what happens is, when you're ready to test the board, you just plug it in. And so, I mean, how many of you would like to connect up five coax cables in the right order 350 times? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> so, so that gets rid of all that problem. And this is basically the test setup that I had to use. So, and guess what I'm using as my test setup? Mercury and Penny Lane. So I've got a perfect generator here and a receiver here. So I just attenuate the signal down, feed it into the board under test. My light's going out. And then I use this, my special test fixture, to look at these in turn, depending on which one of these on the board under test I select. And there it is again, okay. And there's the, the test station set up for the receive testing. Using the, uh, this is the Pandora with the Alex. Here's the step attenuator out here that I used. And the PC over here. This is the power supply to run the, uh, the LPU inside. This is the transmit testing. I thought I'd just put this picture in too because it's slightly different, but it's the same idea. You can see the attenuators right back here. They're inline BNCs. Okay, so now we have a problem. We uh, have a, uh, Alex uses a SPI interface with two data lines, two, two select lines, one for the receiver, one for the transmitter. Well, if I have a receiver board that I made into a test fixture and a receiver board I'm testing, they're on the same line. Uh, that's not going to work. So simple fix, all I did is I just, on the test fixture, I just cut the line and move it over to the opposite one. So now I have a received test fixture that actually looks at the TX line. So now I can plug them together with a standard cable and I can select the relays on both boards with the same software. So that's the solution. It took, I think, three wires and two cuts to do that. And then I can use a standard control cable. Okay, so next problem is, Mercury selects filters based on frequency. So when you set my, your rig to 80 meters, it says, okay, 3.5 megahertz, I'm gonna select that filter. Well, that's not what I wanna do. I wanna run the 3.5 megahertz filter and I wanna run five megahertz through it and I wanna see what it does. I wanna verify that it in fact rejects out of band signals. So I wanna be in control of what filters get selected. Well, I can't do that with Mercury the way it was set up. So the alternative was to haywire something off the side to manually select, which I'd have to do 350 times once for each board. Or what I did is, 
I modify the FPGA firmware to ignore all the frequency commands. And since our filters are broad anyway, I took the bottom seven bits of the frequency and I just encoded the test number into it. And then I just have a table in the FPGA that says, oh, test 31, that must be these filters, boom. And then the FPGA is the one that controls the filters and I control the FPGA. So then I don't have to go beg a software guy to make a change when I need to change the, the uh, relays that are selected. So next problem, there's lots of boards. And no, I don't want to manually sweep, one, sweep each one. So how do I do it? Well, it's repetitive. Computers are pretty good at repetitive tasks. So I have a couple computers. So let's use a computer to do it. So I, co I, mean, I encouraged John to help me write a test program, which means he did it and I used it. And uh, so it really indebted to John for the test program for Alex, because without that test program, we would have nothing. We could not have done this without him. It, it reduced our test time from three months to a week. And I'll show you this. I'm, I know I'm running out of time here, but I. So anyway, we got separate tests for receive and transmit. It allows stepping, so if you want, because the problem is I don't know if the relays are going to be selected right, so I want to be able to step through and then put my scope on the relays and say, okay, I got the right one selected. Oh, I have the wrong one selected. So I require stepping. We also have a six meter uh, amplifier that has to be peaked, trimmer has to be peaked, so we have to stop there with the transmitter on while I tweak the pot for, or the, the cap for the best, uh, for, for peak. So we have to be able to pause. And I wanted the test sequence to be defined by a text file so I don't have to recompile the program every time I find an error in what I asked John to do. So, and it runs on Ubuntu 10.10, free, open source platform that everybody can get hold of. And it's fast. Okay, so to summarize, test fixtures are built from modified production boards so I don't need a custom test fixture. I have a parallel connect with my uh, BNC connector so I can plug those boards in and take them out of the test fixture fast. Custom FPGA image, this is only on our test Mercury, so it's part of our test fixture. And then our custom software with a text file configuration to uh, be able to modify our test. Color-coded pass-fail results on screen, again compiled for Ubuntu, and prevents hair loss because it's fast. And it's too late for me, but you know, Dan's okay now. I don't know, you're looking a little... Uh... <laughs> Okay, this is a picture of our production setup and a few Alex boards there and we have an action photo of Dan here. I tried to get him blurred, you know, like he's, because he's running across to do testing. But he, he, he caught on to this too fast and stopped. So you can see, I think I, I did the, uh, the, receive, uh, the transmit boards and Dan did the receive boards, is that right? Yeah. So his station is in the back and I'm, I'm in the front here. Scotty, is it 1.30 a.m. or p.m. on the clock? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, this is my uh, motto. This, this is, if those of you who know WG0AT, this is his goat that I met in Flagstaff uh, my last month. And I want to thank Graham and John for the help that we got on uh, Alex because it was uh, invaluable. And in my last uh, 30 seconds of overage, I got a video I want to show you that's 15 seconds long. And what it is, it's an actual video that we took of the test sequence. So this is going to go fast. So, so this is the test program. See, I click start, and this is now it's giving me anything in green is a pass, giving me the DBM values. These are all selected in the text file. Then it pauses for you to adjust. Now watch what happens on the, on the display. Dan is tweaking the, uh, the uh, cap. And then if, if he did it right, which he did, it comes up down here. Oh, great. Anyway, the last couple of, uh, of tests here are the result of the, the two sides of the peak that he's set by that adjusting that cap. So if he set the cap right and got it in the middle, then the, either skirt will be correct. If he got it too far to one side, one of them will pass and the other one will fail. And in fact, let me show you what happens when it fails. We put a clip lead across one of the filters to sh and ran the test again just to show you what would happen. So you're running the test. You get down here to the filter that fails, and it says, nope, wrong value. And the amazing thing about this test was that we were able to detect one turn off on the toroid. 
we were able to detect a capacitor of 100 puff off in the wrong place. I mean, obviously we can detect LEDs in backwards and relays rotated and parts missing, things like that. But the fact that we could detect a toroid with one turn off is really amazing. So, and, and the yield was about, uh, we had about 15 boards that no matter what we did, we couldn't spread the turns, we couldn't adjust anything, we could not get it to pass the tests. They just didn't work. So I'm going like, well, what are we gonna do? I really need to have a network analyzer and sweep these boards. And I go, wait, I have a network analyzer right here. So I rewrote the text file to sweep the frequency in 50 kilohertz increments. Ding, 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 ding. So I don't get a nice graph. I get a, a table of the values right here. But what you saw was, you, as it's supposed to be falling off, you see things like this. And so what it was, we could detect these things that were uh, very, uh, very subtle. And but these 15 boards that wouldn't pass, I'm going like, well, how am I going to figure this out? I mean, all the parts are right. I counted all the turns on the toroids. They're all right. All the parts that had any marks on them, they're right. I have a pair of tweezers. SMT tweezers that I can use to measure in circuit values of components and I compare it to a good board and they're all within 5% or so and I'm going like okay now more hair loss and I don't know what's wrong with these boards. So what we did is I, I wrote a program or a, a new text file to sweep the board and I found these inconsistencies in the slope. Well it turns out the filters then, the stages of the filter aren't aligned. So ideally, you have them all aligned at the same pole, so it just is a nice even slope. But if they're not aligned, then you get one pole here, and then it goes back up, and you get another pole, and it's, it's, so it's jagged. And so our test points ended up on some of the peaks or the valleys, and they do, it wouldn't pass. So the result is we're just, we sent those back to the CM to rip out those toroids in that filter. By the way, there's only one filter we had this problem with, the, the 1.5 megahertz filter. And we sent them back to have the toroids replaced. So, you can be assured when you get your board that uh, it passed all of our tests because we're pretty picky when it comes to uh, what we consider a pass. So that's it. I thank you for your time. And uh, I'll be back to see you.